Oh. Sorry, I'm operating with two computers here. All right. Henny Hotu, uh, we are recording, Tiana, I think. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Henny Hotu, uh, welcome to our craft circle. Today we will be doing our We'll be doing an adult craft circle. We're now separated the two from adult and a kid. Uh, but today's adult is going to be loom bead work. Uh, but before we do all that, we got an opening song, introductions, and everything. So, Elizabeth, if you can take it away, please. <laughs> mm. All right. Um Henny Hotsu Yuma Elizabeth Kiri Etisa. Um this evening I'm gonna sing one of our Tunic Boxy Round Dance songs. Koch. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, so I guess we'll do introductions. I, I've already introduced myself. Ima Ryan Etisa. Ima Shkuni Oh, don't tell me I just lost the internet. There we go. I'm back. Okay. <laughs> I, I was about to say, I think I just lost my internet. Dang it. Um, hello. Ima Ryan Etisa. Ima Shkuni Elate Etisa Sahu. Ima Luchi. Iroroni Taruni Taru. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Ryan. I go by Storm Raven in the Tunica language, and I am a Tunica language instructor and student. Uh, Rebecca, or might I say Dr. Moore? Henny Hotu, Ima Rebecca Etisa, Ima uh, Lubi Nuchi Sahu Etisa, or Etisa Sahu. Um, hi, my name is Rebecca. Um, my my name in Tunica, or my other name in Tunica, is Lupi Nukchi. Um, thanks for joining us for Craft Circle. Uh, Tiana. Hey, Mir. Ima Tiana Etisa. Yoroni Kichu Eshkuni Yawa Ikwali Kata. Ima Tawaruni Uchironi. Ima Tawaru. Hey, uh, my name is Tiana in Tunica. They call me Quiet Storm, and I am a Tunica language teacher and student. Sydney. Hini, Ima Sydney Etisa, Ima Tachi Akanuchi Sahu. Hi, my name is Sydney, and my Tunica name is Sunchild. Um, Hachi, Ryan, um, why don't you give us a little bit of background of loom beadwork? Hold on, hold on, let me get that brought up for everybody. There we go. So, of course, you know, beadwork is a traditional craft, or yeah, a traditional craft that a lot of tribes do. Um, but a lot of people kind of don't know the history behind beak work and everything, why it started, where it's, you know, and everything. So, uh, but first I have a quote from David Dean, who, let me grab his book, it's right here. Hopefully, it, this is his book. This is where I got a lot of my information from uh, or historical information about beading. It's Beading in the Native American Tradition. Really great book, really great read. Um, but beadwork, like all art, is a mental process. The differences between the works being craft or art is how much of the creator, how much the creators of such work are willing to give of themselves. Beadwork can be a craft of the mind or an art of the soul. 
Uh, so pre-European contact, most clothing and adornments were made out of the high, made out of or with hide, quills, bone, wampum, woven fibers, or shells. Sometimes certain stones were used as decoration. Also, uh, wampum, which is a shell that is uh, historically known, only came in two colors though, purple and white. And we were limited with our colors. Like we were stuck with your natural earthen pigments most of the time. So your yellows, your reds, your browns. Uh, for loom bead work though, they use, when they started, they used willow branches. And what they, there's an example at your left-hand corner they would bend it and using sinew, that's what they would keep this together. And then they would use bo a bone as a spacer for the sinew and then just work their beads in like we're gonna show you. And I have an example of a quill medallion made by Cheryl Simon of the Mi'kmaq tribe. So quill work is also very beautiful. I'm hoping we can do that here soon too. But post European contact with the introduction of glass beads, uh, native artists were able to expand their colors and trade opportunities. Blue beads being the most sought after color due to the native people not being able to replicate the colors naturally. Native women would usually use a light book, blue, blue, blue color bead for clothing or jewelry because the color represented the sky and the sky was very sacred to a lot of tribes um, and it was just a natural pretty, pretty color really. The styles and amount of beadwork production reached an all-time high in the 1870s, and that was mostly due to us being forced out of our nomadic lifestyles. Um, so it gave us a lot of times to really work, and around that time, beadwork just shot up and trades with beadwork became really popular. But what I have here is an example of what some of the trades were done, mostly for beaver hides. I think I read over the course of the whole time, 10 million beaver hides were probably traded with native people to the Europeans. And so here's a breakdown. So if you had green beads with a white center, you would trade six of those for one made beaver hide. That was a beaver hide that was already processed and ready to go. Uh, six transparent pea sized green or yellow beads also gave you one beaver hide. A large amber transparent blue or pick beads gave you one, and one large opaque blue bead gave you two beaver hides. So that kind of show you, shows you how valuable the blue beads were in post-European contact. And with that actually comes the Tunica treasure. The Tunica treasure is one of the largest archeological finds in Native American history for our tribe. As a matter of fact, it, with our help and the Tunica treasure, that's how we were able to enact the NACRA law which is the Native Americans Graves and Reparations Act. Uh, in the Tunica treasure, there's hundreds of thousands of beads in various styles and makes and colors available. Uh, that was found within the Angola site that can be viewed within the Tunica Biloxi Museum. Hopefully we'll be open in the museum here soon. Uh, so people can come in and see these artifacts. And most of these beads were obtained usually by trades with the Europeans, trades with other tribes and everything. And as you can see with the pictures, there's several different styles. They were called trade beads for the reason that they were used for trade for materials or items and animals and everything. And also it helped with like getting a lot of items in and out. So beads were very valuable back in the day. Now in modern times, native artists, we have an, a, access to an array of styles of beads such as check, bugle, delica, Tri cut, two cut. There's just so many different types of beads and colors out there now that you can work with. Uh, today, we will be working with normal seed beads, the Czech seed beads. And instead of using willow looms, now they're made out of metal, wood, or plastic in different styles. Uh, you'll see my loom here in a few minutes. Uh, I think Rebecca has a metal one right next to her. If you don't mind, yeah, there we go. That's a metal loom. And uh, yeah, let's get, get it to where you can. There you go. And the, the ones I have here, the wooden one is an Ojibwe style bead loom. And that's just uh, the one next to it is just like a normal metal loom that you can pick up from like Michael's, Walmart, Hobby Lobby. Uh, some websites even have them. And of course, you know, there's many content creators like us that use virtual platforms that continue to teach beadwork and coming up with new forms and styles and designs. 
<laughs> in various formats and everything that can be accessed. Um, one of my favorite is actually Crazy Crow. They have their own YouTube channel that they show how to do these crafts and everything. But that is some bead bead work information. So now it's time to set up our loom. Stop share. And let's go ahead and cut this camera on. There we go. So before we, oh. or I guess while you're setting up, Ryan, um, Tiana, could you share the um, craft list or the craft materials list of what we'll be using today with some tunica words of what to call everything? Oh, Dr. Moore. So here's our Yoliana or vocabulary for tonight. Um, we have yunka, which is string, yuki, which is needle, sayota, which is bead, sayota ukini, which is a loom, and kewista maka, which is beeswax. And here are examples of what all that can look like. And here's it up close. So again, we have yunka, which is string, yuki, which is needle, sayata, which is beads, sata ukini, which is a loom, and kewista maka, which is beeswax. Uh, let me know when I'm ready to go, Rebecca. <laughs> uh, yeah, duh. <laughs> okay. Um, now, before I start, this is my loom. This is a Cherokee style loom. Uh, the reason I like this one is because it is adjustable. Uh, this is, I believe, 20 inches, but I have like a little washer here that I can just. Hold on. Ah, there we go. Unscrew that. Take that out. And I can adjust it up to, I believe, three feet is like what I can get it up to. And there goes my other washer. So it's an adjustable one. I like that because I can just change it to what I need. I'm not set or not forced to be set with a certain size or anything but I'm gonna keep it at this. And then it actually comes with an additional attachment where I can actually make it longer if I need to. But I keep it like this because I don't work with really big projects. But if you don't have access to this, we actually have, you can actually make you a tiny little loom like this. This is just a basic little, I would say foot and a half by two feet, maybe give or take. And this is just made with some wood. And nails, and this is a basic square for loom. This is how I started learning out how to start loom, uh, loom work, but I've upgraded to this nice thing. And another material that we forgot to put was paper, because you'll need to plot out your design. Uh, I don't know how well, there we go. I'll bring it up. Oh, all those little square, those circles are, but this is the design that I'm gonna loom or loom my loom, string my loom. There we go, that's the word I'm looking for. String my loom. Uh, so this is the design. This is a design I made for my daughter Mallory uh, for her belt, uh, which was a little small. So I'm gonna have to redo it, make it a little bigger and everything. Oh, uh, sorry, my computer's acting weird. There we go. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to be redoing it, but I'm just going to use it as the basis for this loom tonight, right here, and showing you all how to set it up and getting prepared to start loom. Tonight's is going to be showing you how to start up your loom and everything, and then next month's is going to how to weave, add your string and everything if you run out. But if you can't get access to like a nice PDF like we do, or you can use this is my design notebook, normal graph paper. So this is the middle design of the belt that you've seen that my cats kind of ate. 
right here. And this is how I plotted or came up with it and plotted it out and then implemented it on my other design. So graph paper is really useful. Um, the only drawback I don't like is that sometimes your graph paper lines can be a little lighter than what you need to be. And sometimes the colors get mixed up with it. So now you're wondering why we're just setting up the loom first because these things can take a while to set up. <laughs> so I have, let me recount my, my rows. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37. Wow, 37. Forgot how big this piece was. <laughs> so I have 37 rows because I'm going to be working like this. This is my beginning of my bead work and trying to hide where the cat's ate it. This is my end. So in all, oh, you're going to see it. This is how. I mean, on paper, it looks bigger, but it's gonna be a little smaller in person. So the first thing you wanna do is get your yunka or your string. This is quilting thread. This is a 60 gauge quilting thread, I believe. Yeah, 60. Uh, quilting thread is probably the best to use for loom bead work because it's stronger. You don't have to worry about it breaking as often. Uh, and I don't beeswax this part. Uh, I will beeswax my normal, my nylon thread. That's what's going to keep it from knotting up and everything. I'm trying to think of the word, sorry. So uh, let me see how well I can do this. Maybe what I need to do is adjust it and zoom in. There we go. There we go. Perfect, perfect. So as you can see, I have three nails sticking out. And what this is for is as I add on my strings, I'm gonna start wrapping around different points. And that's what's gonna help, along with my spacer, that's what's gonna help keep my strings uh, separated. So what I'm gonna do is start by knotting it up on my first nail. Ah. You know what? I might let me do it the easy way. Do it in a big loop first, and then I messed up already. Oh, no. There we go. And of course, you always want a double knot. If I could get a hold of this string, hold on. One and then one through there. Uh -oh. okay. And then in and out. See, always the hard part getting it all set up. One knot and two knots. So there we go. I have my initial thread set up. Now that I have, okay, I always hate the string math. I have 37 rows. So I need to do string math. So that's add two, subtract one. So I'll need 30 or no, add three, subtract one. What is that string math again, Elizabeth? Because <laughs> usually what I do is I add two to the first two rows and two to the end, and that kind of keeps it a little stronger than normal, but I always forget the actual string math for this. Um, I don't remember exactly the formula that I gave y'all, but I, I do remember if you have five beads, for example, you're gonna wanna place um, two, 
two uh, threads on the outside and on both sides. So two here, two here, and that reinforces your, um, your work. Oh, okay, yeah, so I had it right, yeah, okay. So, <laughs> so you'll have two, two threads, three, four, five, six, seven, eight right here. So for five beads, you'll have eight strands total on your loom. <clears throat> and just to show you as an example, that helps to reinforce the outside of your work. Yeah. It makes it oh, stronger. I just have my, my other bead work. Right. Oh, yeah, here we go. So this is a, another peat loom. Let me, I got to autofocus here. This camera's autofocus does not want to play well with me today. There we go. So this is what Elizabeth is talking about is this edge right here. You need to really reinforce because that's what's going to keep your beads together. And this is a keychain I made two years ago, three years ago, give or take. <laughs> I don't know. I'm always busy doing stuff. So with that being said, with my first, um, with my spacers, there's a lot here. And from what I learned with this loom in particular is start one, two, three spaces in the spacer, because that's going to give you enough room. So right there to work with the beads and everything. And I've actually seen some people with using this they would take the spacer off and put the amount of beads that they're working with and tape them down and use that as their spacer. Or uh, springs like the metal loom that Rebecca has, they use that for a spacer. Uh, but I mean, the, the, the funniest or the easiest way I've actually seen is, yeah, they would use the, yeah. They would take how many beads they're working with with the size of bead that they're working with and tape that down and use that as their spacer, which. I probably should have done just to demonstrate, but all my beads are in a huge box. I got to reorganize my whole closet with all my crafts because they're everywhere. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is take it, run it over. So one, two, three. And I'm going to place it in this spacer down at the other end. So now what I'm going to do is at the end of this side, there's three more nails. I'm going to wrap it around. And I'm actually going to go through the space that the string's already taking up for my reinforcement. So right there. And I'm going to string it back through. and do it, do the same thing on the opposite end. So let me find where my string is, right there. And again, since I'm just working on my beginning end, oh, bring it down. I'm gonna wrap my string around my nail. And now I'm gonna start with my normal thread. So I'm gonna go for the space Next to this one, and this is why these little nails, the springs and spacers are helpful. It's so you, it helps you keep track of your beads and everything. My hands are not in frame. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> it helps with your beads and everything. Because when we get to the actual beading on your loom, you'll see why keeping your spacer here helps. Because um, when we learn how to bead on this, there was a lot of frustration. <laughs> oh God, I don't know how many times when I first learned how many times I stopped and kept going like, okay, I'm gonna try and get this, try and get it and stop because it's just like, you can see hey, how chaotic these strings are just on this. So I found spacers really help. <laughs> so I am actually off by a space. I do not know what happened to my little mic uh, my magnifying glasses that I had that really helps with this because 
I have really bad hands, eyesight, and really big hands. <laughs> so, I mean, and this is just pretty much how it is setting up your loom. As stated before, this takes a while and you could run into some complications if not done properly. So right there, um, actually looking at it, what size beads am I working? Let me grab my beads right quick, sorry. Let me see what size I'm working with again here. I normally work with size 11 beads. Um, so here are some size, here, size 11 beads. They're pretty small. Um, I work with smaller beads because you tend to get better designs out of your, excuse me, loom bead work. Um, I think this is size 10 beads I worked with. So looking at this, I might want to skip a space and go for the next one. Yes, that looks a lot better. And now I just got to do this. My, my pattern was 37, 37 times, or actually 41 times because the additional two that I had to add. <laughs> and while I'm doing that, do we have any questions popping up? And again, bring it through, wrap it around needle. Bring it up, and now I'm going to shoot for the space next. Yes. Does anybody want to add on to their loom bead work stories? The bitches. Watching me guess. <laughs> Let me get back over here. So that's one, two rows so far. So I got 35 left to go. And yep. also, we have Tunica language classes going. If you would like to register, please check out the LCRP Facebook page where we have links to all classes with times and everything available. Uh, if you are five to 10 years old, Tiana, Miss Tiana is your teacher. If you are 11 to 16, Miss Sydney is your teacher. And then I teach these 17 and older people. I really wish I had my magnifying glasses right now. I have a question, Ryan. Home. Um, when, maybe not when you're totally done with that, because you still have 30, however many to go. <laughs> yes. Do you, are you able to give us an example of how to start one of these? Do you have one of those with you? Um, I do not, because I all I have is this and this. Okay. Which is already gone, going, but I could, I could, talk you through getting started. <laughs> okay. Is the it's not that hard to get started. Because uh, once you get started and you get your first two to three rows on there, then the beads pretty much just start setting themselves. Okay, cool. Yeah. I mean, the hardest part, like always, is getting your loom going and then getting your first rows of beads on there. And then once you get that on there, it's pretty much golden. And then, you know, if you run out of string, then that's when you run into another issue, but we will go over that. <laughs> so is it pretty similar when you have one that looks like this and how you're doing it now on your loom? Do I um, thread my loom here similarly to how you're threading it there? Yes, because okay. like your yours, like uh, like both of ours, we have these spacers. Yours is that metal spring. Mine just so happens to be, I think it's actually a cone for our horses here. Mm 
Rebecca, well, can you be, turn much your... Be... Oh, sorry. I'll go ahead and list, sorry. Can you turn the, the loom around? Like, give us a 360 view of it. Oh, yes, I can. <laughs> Hold up, let me get my string placement. So it looks like they tied the um, the strings on individually to each side. Mine or um, Rebecca's? Yeah, so, the metal, metal loom. Yeah, so I followed the directions in the box for this metal loom. <laughs> Okay. And I may or may not have done this right. I just, I counted out a certain number of strings and then tied it at the top. And then right where the knot was at the top of that group of strings, I um, put it against this nail or screw thing. That's yeah, yeah that, that looks right. It looks like you, you did it right. Okay. Um, you don't have to double up your outside threads, but you can. It's it's um, it's recommended because it, it yeah it helps pres it helps keep the life of your beadwork pretty much. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it definitely looks like you did it right. Um, you just want to make sure you know that your threads are secure onto the loom. Um, and when you're done, you're basically going to uh, either tape or tie the threads together, like I did to this one. Yeah. And you'll just cut it away from the loom. So this is tape. This is a uh, this is just regular in invisible tape. Yep. Cool. T cut. Oh wait. I've been doing it the hard way this whole time and you guys had an easier way and didn't tell me. I see how it is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I like it this way because it's kind of, I have more, I don't know, I probably would have had more control with the other way. Right. And I'm probably putting too much space in between each of my rows, but I mean, I know as I'm loop, uh, beating my loom, I can tighten that up and close that space up. But, oh God, what row? I lost count, thanks guys. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, I'm up to eight. <laughs> and again, next month, that's when we're gonna show you how to start it. Or if you guys wanna take the initiative um, Elizabeth, can you do me a favor and walk Rebecca through getting hers going while I get this going? Um, okay. So, um, Rebecca, it, it looks like you, you finished um, tying your, your strings onto your loom. Are you willing to cut those away and redo it? Okay. I mean, <laughs> I, I was talking about starting process of weaving. Oh, process of weaving. Oh, okay. We we might want to wait until next time. Yeah. Let's okay. Yeah, let's wait until once, next time. once the loom is set up. All right. <laughs> but I can do. I can fix this so I can be set up for next time. Yeah. yeah. And. Oh, you know what? We should have had some examples of loom bead work brought up for people so they can see like how how complicated I said, I won't say complicated, how, what's the word? Uh, it's an, an e or intricate, intricate the designs can get. Yeah, um, I have a few examples. Oh yeah, um, do you want to share your screen? Yeah. Well, I, I have them right here with me. Oh yeah. You don't need to share screen. Mm -hmm. Got them live. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have so, some. This is one small, one small piece. I have um, three pieces that look just like this. Um, I have two smaller ones. They're identical to each other, um, and one longer one. These were intended. Um, to be sewn onto a belt. 
And so there were three sections that I was going to um, yep. create onto the belt. But um, belt. Yeah, yeah. So similar to this one that Ryan's showing us right now. Um, and then you have so, the waistband. Yep. So. Yeah, a little more. You can create belts, you can create lanyards. Um, earrings, we've seen people do earrings with it. Earrings, I, I even done a, a barrette. I'll show you the barrette in a minute. Yeah, um, barrettes are nice. This, this set was done in size 13 beads. So- um, Smaller than what I'm working with. Right, even smaller than what, what Ryan has, um, that he's working with right now. So you can see, I think mine, this this was done in about 30, um, 30 something rows of beads. So that's how wide it is. Um, this is the barrette that I did. This is like one of the first pieces of loom work um, that, I, that I worked on. I was, I was probably, yeah, I was probably like maybe 12, 13 years old when I made this one. Um, but this one's a little bit different because I decreased the number of beads to make those um, corners like that. Um, this is a barrette. So it has, you know, you wear it in your hair. Um, it has a clasp to attach it to your hair. Just like that, it's a metal clasp, opens and closes. Um, and it has a zipper edging on it. That's why it looks different. It doesn't have a plain edge, but you can see how I decreased the number of beads on the outside rows right here. Um, this is one that I did, I think like this was the first loom work that I did um, when I was younger. Um, when I when I got older and I had my daughter, it became her belt. I I intended it to be a choker for myself, but then when I got older, it became a belt for my daughter when she was little. Um, so I, I you can see I I didn't finish this edge. It doesn't have a, a zipper edging on it. It's just you know plain. Um, it's loom work, and then I backed it with felt, and then over the felt I put um, buckskin or you know leather, um, and and that was you know so I could wear it, it could be worn um, without you know it breaking um, or anything. But you can see this is a you know a narrower piece. It isn't as wide. These beads are size 10. So they're they're just one size bigger than what Ryan is working with. But you can see that the colors change just about, you know, on, on every row and it creates that diamond pattern like that. And also, I would recommend that when you start with bead work, don't shoot for some huge project. <laughs> Start off small, like I did with my keychain. I think this is one, two, three, four, nine rows of beads. Because I think I did the math for this. I have to add two more rows, so that's going to be 39. But before that, I think this is a, this prod, my belt project took me about 4,000 something hundred beads just to do the belt project. So Shoot for something smaller. I would recommend like a keychain, a barrette, some earrings or something. So that way you can get used to how to set it up and your patterns and everything. But I mean, if you're like me and you like to go big or go home, then go for it. There we go. <laughs> Sydney, Tiana, do you guys have anything to say about moonbeam work? Okay, that's too wide. Um, 
It's oh, very thank you. <laughs> I know I'm being oh the, okay. I thought you were talking the, about the that. loom, right? The loom. <laughs> okay. Uh, see how it is. No. <laughs> so oh, I lost count of rooms again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Halfway there, everybody, halfway there. <laughs> One thing I like about, I, I absolutely like about loom bead work is once you get it set up and you get going, starting to weave your beads in, you just, you just like disassociate with everything. And then next thing you know, it's been like four or five hours and you have like almost have a completed piece of bead work. <laughs> also could kind of be kind of dangerous if you're running late for work. What were you doing? I was bead working. <laughs> bead working? Would that be it? I mean, it for... this said another room takes, it takes a minute. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I kind of disassociated for like three minutes while Elizabeth was talking because I'm just sitting here focused on getting my strings all evenly laid out. And there's so many, as we stated before, there's so many things you could do with beadwork. Um, I think at one point, Sydney was working on a dog collar for her dog. Um, this that I have here was actually for a friend and then COVID hit and I completely forgot about it, but they never asked for it. So, I mean, I, I just kind of use it as an example now. <laughs> No, watch, I say that they're watching this and they're gonna be like, oh, I want it now. There we go. Uh, how are we looking for time? Who's timekeeping? We are so good. time. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> We're at uh, 13. Let's see, what else can I talk about for B Luma? Um, How does the side of your loom look? Are you wrapping it around a um, yep. nail or screw? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, yeah, three nails. Okay. Yep. Right. I'm I'm on my middle nail now. Okay. And this is this is the way it, the reason I picked this loom is these nails actually act like as, as a great stabilizer for your strings and everything. Uh, that way I'm not worried about like them getting all tangled up with each other. Uh, they're staying nice and straight as I'm pulling the string and everything. So I, this is why I absolutely love this form of be, uh, loom. Now granted, my first time working with it, I'm sure some people remember because I streamed it on Twitch. I did it completely wrong and I had to go back and redo everything. Because <laughs> that was my first time working with this type of loom. But I wanted something that was just, in my, in my own just opinion, something easier to work with. Because um, these, I don't know what that was, but I'm afraid to go ask my children. Because uh, this, again, just got, so frustrating after a while. <laughs> but I mean, I'm not gonna lie, that is a good beginner loom to learn on because it's it kind of replicates the old style loom that we're used to working with, like the, uh, the willow branch and the sinew. Uh, if you wanna make your own, there's actually a lot of cool uh, YouTubers out there that show you how to make your own loom and everything in different styles that fit what you want. Um, one I watched, he made a loom that was supposed to be for beadwork, but after a while, he was able to adapt it to do actual weaving, like cloth weaving and fiber weaving. So I thought that was pretty cool. And then there's um, there's a loom sold by that butterfly lady, and she calls it the endless loom. It is where you can continuously work on a piece um, I think the longest piece she was able to work on that loom was about 12, 15 feet long. So, but the only thing is she hand makes those looms and they're like 80, 90, $100. So, 
Whereas this good old boy right here only runs you about 20 to 30. <laughs> Um, but of course, then, you know, everybody has their own way. Like, I like this one. I've tried working with an Ojibwe style. No offense to Wendell. Um, loom, I just didn't like the way it was. Uh, I loved how I could use different size wooden dowels to adjust to my size and everything. But just the grooves in the wood just kept throwing me off. <laughs> What is the point of grooves in the wood? Is that uh, the grooves in the woods kind of acted like your spacers for your metal, um, your metal loom, but they were already a set size. So it's like this one I can like this one where I can adjust to what size beads and oh I hate working in reverse with cameras sometimes. Okay, this way, this way. Where are you? There you are. <laughs> So the, the grooves were already set, whereas this one I have, as you can see, let me turn it to the side. I can actually take these spacers out and ch change them out with other uh, size space, excuse me, size spacers. Whereas with the Ojibwe one that I worked with, it was already set. I couldn't change the size of the spacers or anything. And at, oh, I just messed up my string. It looks like that's the same with the with the metal ones too. You don't really have an option in terms of spacing. It just comes like that. Yeah. But I think the spacing here is like, I think this is maybe meant for beginners. I don't know. Yeah, usually the metal looms are meant for a beginner. Um, I do, uh, one of my favorite TikTokers, she does still use a metal loom and she shows how you can get more intricate designs out of him. Uh, even with the set spacers and how to like, because uh, what she does is she'll just wrap leather around the springs and take beads on for her uh, spacers. And that's how she'll, she gets around the set spacer size. But she makes some really great work. And to be honest, I Googled it today. There is no Guinness World Record for the longest set of beadwork. So uh, that might be something we can work on. I wouldn't mind having a Guinness World Record. There we go. So for people who are starting out um, with beadwork for the first time, do you have any like tips or tricks? Hate is gonna be your best friend. <laughs> Because you can just say, like right now, if I have to get up and leave, I will take just a normal piece of scotch tape and put my thread down so that way I don't have to worry about it undoing itself and my string just start popping off. I don't have to worry about my, well, I, I still have to worry about my cat jumping up here and like playing with the thread. But tape is going to be your best friend. Uh, again, like I stated before, start out with something small and work your way up. Uh, if you can't if you can't get access to the metal loom or a loom like this, find you like a nice sturdy uh, square object. I've actually seen some people use uh, plastic bins as their loom, and what they do is they just burn the holes through, and that's how they pass their string through as a spacer. Um, pretty much, just starting out, putting up your loom, start small. Um, find with any craft, find what you're comfortable with. And of course, safety first. Um, next, next month we will be working with needles. Oh, the camera died. Hold on one second. I have a backup battery. <laughs> and if you decide to live stream backup batteries, they're always useful. Uh, uh oh, I don't think I can get to the battery with this. <laughs> Let me see. Well, Maybe. while Ryan is working on these technical difficulties, um, I can go ahead and share um, some of the upcoming events. I know that Ryan had already mentioned. Um, let me share my screen. Ryan had already mentioned um, the weekly classes. Um, 
but uh, to reiterate them, we have our 11 to 16 year old weekly tuna classes at 4 p.m. on Thursdays, and then our 17 plus or adult weekly tunica language class at 5 p.m. on Thursdays. Um, we also will have our 5 to 10 year old weekly tunica class at 4 p.m. on Mondays. Um, Tiana, it, will there also be a class on Wednesday? for the five to 10 year olds? Oh, I will also be teaching um, five to 10 year olds on Wednesdays from five to 6 p.m. for all those that are not able to make it on Mondays. Oh yeah, and Tuesdays, if you can't make my Thursday class, I think, yeah, five or five, I was about to say 6.30, but that's for a different, <laughs> 6.30, to 7.30, I will be doing classes on Tuesdays if you want to attend, if you have to work during the day. <laughs> I'm a horrible pitch person. <laughs> um, and for our 11 to 16 year old class, six, 11 to 16 year old class, um, for now they will be at 4 p.m., but the time might be likely to change. It might be at 5 p.m. Um, but we will keep you guys updated about that. Um, our next craft circle will be a kids version of this craft, um, also hosted by Mr. Ryan Lopez. Um, okay, and then we will have our next craft circle next month, and it'll be a continuation of this one to learn how to start beading once you have your loom um, threaded and ready to go. And then on March 8th, there will be another um, kids craft circle as a continuation of the February kids craft circle. And in March, we will have a uh, tunica story time on Saturday the 5th, as well as February the 5th, um, which is this week. <laughs> Um, I got a pencil up here. Where did, up anything here. else to add? Sign up for language classes. <laughs> Here's some more examples of some yeah. work. This is mine. This is the first one I, I ever did. Um, it's just nine rows. I want to say it was size 11 check CV to be used for this one for these and this is my little pattern. I kept it not too crazy, pretty simple. And then this is the second one that I completed. This one has 23 rows. And again, it was size 11 check seed beads. That's what this pattern looks like. A little bit more complicated than the first one which looks like this. And I kept my stitching real simple. I didn't, I didn't go crazy with it. She's real. Yeah, she's not like me. <laughs> I did have a book of them, it's just real simple. You can't even see this one, but it's the same. There we go. All right, three more rows, everybody. Three more rows. Oh, I just heard a crash and I'm afraid to go check on it. <laughs> I don't know if it's my cats or my kids. Two more rows. There we go. One more room. All right, so now what I'm going to do is double up on this end. There we go. 
There we go. We're ready to go. I got it doubled up. And now to tie end it off, I'm just going to go ahead and triple knot it. I usually triple knot my end just to make sure it doesn't undo itself. Uh, since I'm not allowed to use my other tools on camera, uh, I will use my metal cutters. So what I'm gonna do is wrap it a few times and then see how it is. There we go. Nope, get back on there. There's one knot. So we'll have to loop it again. If you have noticed, I do talk to myself a lot while I do stuff like this. So, so what I can do is probably something like this. And again, having big fingers does not help when it comes to delicate crafts like this. And cut that off. There we go. It's all knotted up and ready to be woven. And I ended just on time. See? Oh, let me get this. And that's pretty much how mine's going to look. Um, Depending on the type of loom you use, it's going to look differently. Uh, so this is where I got mine. Uh, it's actually from Crazy Crow, but this is the company that makes it. On the other end. There we go. And as you can see, all my threads are there, ready to go. Catch Ryan. Um, so before we go, we will play a closing song. Let me share my screen. Hello, hello everyone. Today we'd like to share with you a traditional Tunica Bluxy song. This is the Midnight Dance Song. All right, well, Tikach Hotu for coming and joining us tonight um, for Craft Circle. Join us next month to learn how to actually do some beadwork on the looms you have now set up. Um, all right, well, Tikach, Hita. Hita.